Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this SciShow video. Brilliant is offering all SciShow viewers a 30-day free trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription for the first 200 people to sign up at brilliant.org scishow. You might have heard of the placebo effect. It's when you feel better because you think you're being treated for something, but you never really got the medicine. You might have received a sugar pill or a salt water injection instead. But here's the mind-blowing part. Those two placebos would affect your body in different ways, because there's more than one placebo effect. As it turns out, it's not just a matter of believing it's working or not. Different imaginary treatments actually make you release different chemicals, creating different results. And it often depends on what they're pretending to be. An oxygen placebo works differently from an anti-inflammatory placebo, which works differently from an opioid placebo. And some objectively work better than others. So if not all placebos are created equal, Doc, give me the strongest placebo you've got. Let's start at the beginning. Placebos work. I know it might sound odd that you sometimes feel better after not receiving a treatment that's been clinically demonstrated to be effective, but yeah, that's the placebo effect. A meta-analysis covering 152 publications, including almost 25,000 participants, found that placebos can be just as effective as drugs. That doesn't mean that you'll feel better every time you take a placebo, but in some situations, they do the job. If you use a placebo to reduce pain, there's a good chance it will work similarly to real treatment. On the other hand, if you use a placebo to reduce nausea, it might be less effective. And here's why. Your experience of pain is not something that a doctor can observe and report on without you describing it to them. It's your subjective experience, and you can have varying amounts of pain. So you could be one of those slightly frowny faces on the chart. But when it comes to something like losing your lunch, well, that either happens or it doesn't. It's a binary outcome. And placebos are better at treating subjective continuums of concern, like pain, than binary concerns, like puking. So part of what determines how effective a placebo is, is what you're trying to treat. Another part of the puzzle is which placebo you're taking. Just like how not every drug is as effective as the next, some placebos are more effective than others. And some of it comes down to packaging. For instance, placebos that are presented as being more expensive reduce pain better. That's a real finding from a real study. The researchers administered painful, but not too painful, shocks to the study participants and had them rate their pain. Then they gave them opioid placebo pills and readministered the shock to see if the pain changed. And to be clear, these were placebos pretending to be opioids. The researchers told some participants that they were getting pills that cost about what you'd expect an opioid to cost. And they told other participants participants that they were getting significantly cheaper opioid pills, like, here, take this pill we paid 10 cents for. And the cheap placebos were significantly less effective at reducing pain. So you have to trust that the pill will work. And maybe that's part of why brand name products get to be so expensive. Another study focused on the brand effect by using placebos to treat a different kind of pain. This time, they heated up the participants' forearms for 20 seconds, at which point it became painfully hot. Then they told the participants they'd get either aspirin or the made-up generic 1A pharma pill prior to the heat being applied again. And the aspirin placebo took away more pain than the 1A pharma placebo did. So there's a brand name effect. But this study didn't stop there. They also used a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, or fMRI, to see how people's brains responded to the brand name and generic placebos. One part of the brain in particular was way more active when they got the brand name placebo than the generic. And that's the prefrontal cortex, which takes care of decision making and working memory. It's like you're deciding whether aspirin or a generic pill would work better while you're taking the placebo. But aside from what placebo you take, how often you take it also influences how well it works. A meta-analysis of over 3,000 patients being treated for ulcers found that taking more doses of a placebo was associated with feeling better faster. On average, significantly more people who took placebos four times per day were fully recovered by four weeks than people who took them two times per day. Now, this is a correlation across several studies, so we can't say exactly what's driving these results. But one idea proposed by the researchers is that receiving more treatment 
treatment puts you in a state of mind of being cared for and healing, which then causes your body to go through changes to make that happen. Like, your body could boost its immune system and start making more compounds called prostaglandins, which are involved in healing wounds and infections. But we need more research to say definitively if that's how it works. All we know is that you could get the exact same placebo as someone else and have drastically different results because of how you interpret the care you're receiving. So just imagine how different the results become when you get a different placebo. For example, there are several different ways to take away an altitude headache. That's because these headaches come from the drop in oxygen when you reach really high elevations, which can initiate a few different pathways to headache town. Like at low oxygen levels, you could end up making more prostaglandins than usual, which open up your blood vessels and may provoke headaches. Or because there's not as much oxygen, you could start hyperventilating, which may also provoke headaches. Those two pathways would be treated with different approaches. You'd take something like aspirin to stop prostaglandins from being made, while an oxygen mask would be more helpful to stop you from hyperventilating. So one study took advantage of those two mechanisms to compare the effectiveness of different placebos. In this case, the participants were conditioned to expect a particular effect from their treatment. So instead of just giving them a pill and saying it's aspirin, the researchers gave them real aspirin, which really stopped prostaglandins from being made and got rid of their headaches. And then they did it again and gave them the placebo pill. And they did the same preconditioning with a real oxygen mask followed by a placebo oxygen mask. So these people's bodies already had generated a response to the real treatments. Then when the real stuff was swapped out for placebos, their bodies kept up the response as if they were getting the original treatment. The placebo aspirin affected a bunch of prostaglandins that the placebo oxygen mask didn't, and the placebo oxygen mask got rid of hyperventilation, which the placebo aspirin didn't. So different placebos can have totally different effects on your body. And since the real oxygen mask was better at reducing altitude headaches than real aspirin, the placebo oxygen mask worked better than the placebo aspirin. These results are pretty incredible, but taking a pill and putting on an oxygen mask are very different experiences. Surely if you got an injection that's pretending to be a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, and another injection that's pretending to be an opioid, you wouldn't respond any differently because you're getting a shot either way. Well, this next study might prove that suspicion wrong. This time around, researchers went back to the tried and true arm pain metric. And to reduce that pain, they gave participants either the NSAID, Ketorolac Tromethamine, or the opioid drug, Morphine Hydrochloride. Just like in the last experiment, these are both effective painkillers despite initiating different chemical pathways in the body. And just like the last experiment, participants were preconditioned to know what response would come from the real deal before switching to a placebo. Once they stopped getting the drugs and started getting saline or saltwater placebos, they still felt better. So the saline placebos worked for both the NSAID and the opioid drugs. And even though everyone was getting the placebo at this point, we know from the last study that preconditioned placebos can still activate the specific chemical pathways that the real treatment did. So when the researchers gave their participants the anti-opioid drug naloxone, it brought the pain back for the people who were taking the morphine placebo, but not the Ketorolac placebo, because naloxone isn't relevant to how NSAIDs work. Which means that even the exact same saline injection can make your body respond in different ways depending on how you've been preconditioned for it. A placebo that comes after preconditioning seems to use whatever pathways that real drug used to make you feel better. But preconditioning isn't the only way to get the placebo effect. Sometimes you're just told it's a strong pain reliever without getting the real pain reliever first. In those cases, naloxone also brought back the pain. So that kind of placebo without preconditioning probably uses an opioid pathway to take your pain away. Ultimately, placebos can make your body respond in a ton of different ways. And it's not all smoke and mirrors. When a researcher comes out and tells you that you're getting a placebo, it still works. It just might not work as well as if they told you you were getting a different one. So maybe think twice before calling placebos fake medicine, because the complex effects they have on your body are very real. Placebos are a brilliant medical tool, but you know what else is brilliant? Brilliant. The interactive online learning platform with thousands of lessons in science, computer science, and math. The people who made these brilliant courses are so brilliant that they've explained unbelievably complicated stuff like how large language models work in seven digestible lessons. And the coolest part is that you are brilliant too. After taking the brilliant course How LLMs Work, you'll have behind the scenes insights on LLMs from predicting the next word to making a coherent statement. Now, your brilliance isn't defined by whether or not you know how LLMs work, but at the end of the day, 
day, knowledge is something that everyone can and should have, which is why Brilliant and SciShow love working together. We both love spreading knowledge about awesome stuff into the world. So you can learn about LLMs and all sorts of other cool stuff at brilliant.org scishow or at the link in the description down below. That link will also give the first 200 people to sign up 20% off an annual premium Brilliant subscription, and you'll get your first 30 days for free. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this SciShow video. 